Well, welcome back. Happy New Year. I know that last weekend was officially New Year, but I just want to say I am excited about what we get to talk about in the Honed series. And I know last week, Pastor Ed, he really uh, pressed into a passage from 2 Peter. So if you have your sermon notes, or if you're online watching, you can get those uh, digitally. He addressed these key ideas of adding things to our faith, uh, for, or, or adding things to our walk of God, including starting with faith and goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance, and on and on it goes, that I want you to know that this sermon series is about the things that we do to pursue God that help add these things to our faith. And I'm excited about this this message because really at the heart of this, God is asking us to place ourselves on the anvil and allow the master to work on us in, in our obedience to be shaped by what he desires in us. And so as I think about that, as we were prepping for this sermon series, I was really struck by the making of samurai swords, actually. I was fascinated one day when I watched the making of a sword, partly because by themselves, they're incredibly uh, artistic in nature. Uh, these swords, not only are they a blend of different metals and they're designed for a purpose and they're sharp as can be and highly polished, but what it takes to create them really blows me away. And so I, I kind of compare what a sword maker has to do and what they go through to become a master sword maker. And then I look at my own life and I, I kind of challenge myself to say, am I that committed to being a follower of Christ? Do I, am I willing to invest? So just a little bit of a glimmer into sword making. Here's kind of some of the things you, you should know. For one, these uh, specifically katana Japanese samurai swords, the process starts literally from the ground up and they dig up a bunch of iron ore and they heat it in such a way that it's very carefully monitored to produce the right chemical balance of these men minerals to create the metal they need. And so in that process, there's people that are very skilled at that. And they get this iron out and they take the flakes and they look at the edges mainly and they look and they look for precisely the kind of metal they need for sword making. Uh, they're very skilled at this. They know what it looks like. A lot of the metal is used in pots and pans and so forth, but the sword making metal is very particular. And so after this great inspection, they go through an arduous process of heating the metal and then pounding this metal like you would mix batter for cookies or something. They pound and they pound and they fold and they pound and they fold and they pound. And these guys work on this for months to get the metal mixed to the right consistencies and the right everything it takes to actually make a sword. And even in their process, these, these guys are so gifted that as they're getting to the final touches of a sword, they don't use uh, thermometers to measure if the metal's the right temperature. They're so skilled at what they do that they look at the coloration of it. Is it the right color of red to be 800 degrees to do what they need the, the metal to do to be hardened and ready to be a true sword? It amazes me then it doesn't just stop there. Not only do they pound and shape and then get the basics together, but then they hand it off to some more experts who take different sanding stones, 10 different stones they work through, and 10 days of polishing, just working it, not only to remove imperfections, but to get that edge razor sharp and ready for battle. And then finally, it comes down to the last step. And this, this blows my mind, but this meticulous work where they take just little grain sizes of a powder and use that as the final polishing to extract out of the sword the beauty of the different metals that have been melded together. This process fascinates me because what the dedication is it takes to do this. I want you to, to think about this. These are skilled craftsmen. They spend, um, to be a sword maker, they spend three years, a minimum of three years, living in a facility, producing and working with craftsmen, learning the craft six days a week, diligently focused. At the three-year mark, they then are allowed to make their own sword. And then another five years 
of diligent skill working before they're considered a master. Think about that. Eight years of investment to create a sword that would cost in our day today now, if you want to purchase one of these swords, you can expect to pay as high as $50,000 for a sword that will probably be hung on a wall, set on a mantle or in a case. But see, that sword originally was designed with a purpose, and it was designed for war. And God, in his, in my thinking of this sword crafting, God is like working on us, but we are the craftsmen of our faith that we're called to add to. And we're called to be diligent, and so I'm, I'm challenged by the dedication a sword maker might give. And I ask myself, am I that committed to being a follower of Christ? Is my obedience in line with what a sword maker's obedience would be? And so today, I want you to know that I want to challenge your heart to really begin in this series of being honed, that we're working out uh, little meticulous pieces of our faith. And so one of the, the things I want you to know, too, is that you have been designed not for display, but for a purpose. And your purpose is to shine the glory of God so that many would know him through your good deeds. And so I'll start with a definition of what we're going to press into today, and that is grace giving. We're going to talk about giving. And I want you to hear this definition. It says, grace giving is our response to the way God graciously treats us. How I serve God, how I am grace giving oriented, how I am generous, right, is a response to the way God graciously treats us. And it makes me think of Ephesians where it says this, for grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. So first, this great gift of salvation was given freely to us and it cost a lot. And so I want to put the elephant in the room. When we started talking about this, the question was, well, you have a difficult topic, Craig. And I said, oh, what is it? Is it circumcision? They said, no, it's money. I was like, oh, that's even harder. We're going to talk about money today. Specifically, we're going to talk about money. I said, yep. So there it is, the elephant's in the room. And before you sign off or check out, get up and walk out or tune out, I want you to hear something. This is an important topic. Here's, here's some of the reasons why it is so important. One, there's over 2,300 verses dedicated to things about money as compared to around 500 focused on prayer and faith throughout the scriptures. Money has a huge amount of conversation through God's word. He talks about it through wealth or possessions or greed, money mindset, contentment, investing, generosity, overall stewardship, on and on it goes that 13% of the Bible is focused on money or attributes of money. And then we look at Jesus and we realize that of 11 of the 39 parables are targeted to money, like the parable of the talents, where Jesus talks about investing in the kingdom and for those who are given much, much will be given. And, and it's an interesting parable as you walk through and you see that Jesus knows that money has a big influence. And so if you're wondering today, oh boy, here we go. Craig wants to guilt me or wants to force me to give money. That is not my heart at all. In fact, I hope that you will listen to the great reasons of why we are called as followers of Christ to be investing our finances. So I want to start from here. Why don't people give? There is actually some good reasoning why people don't give in the first place. Now, first one is they're just not a believer. And so if that's you, if you're just not yet a believer of Christ, that is totally understandable. Why would you invest in the kingdom that you're not really committed to yet or a part of? I'm glad you're listening. I'm glad you're here. But I want you to listen closer to the heart of giving rather than what is typically the motivation of uh, a force or a pushing or a guilt-driven approach to being generous. So one, people just don't believe yet. Second is they don't know why we give. What's the heart behind it? And I hope to, to press into the why today. Why do we give? Why is that important? Why do we give money? 
Next is that they have a di- you're having, they're having, you're having maybe a difficult financial season. And in that season, maybe it's a mounting of medical bills and maybe it's a loss of a job. And by all means, there are reasons why at times you just look at your life and you say, it is difficult. I don't know what to do. I'm not even sure where we're going to have money to feed ourselves. And that's understandable. Second, uh, another one, excuse me, is that they just don't know how. And so let me make it clear at Family Church, this is how we give here. We have an envelope. And uh, if you attend the campuses, you can put your, your giving and your, your giving of generosity in those envelopes and turn those in in your hallway or find a place in the building where it's uh, a drop box or a, a gift giving place. You can also do it online and use your app. There's lots of other ways to give. So that's how we do that here. We don't um, pass an offering plate. That's just the, the strategy as we feel God has called you to give and we challenge you to follow God. And so that's how you give here. Another one is they don't know where the money really goes. That's another reason people don't give. And so just as a, a brief snapshot, I mean, I want you to think about um, the chairs you're sitting in or the video you're watching. There was production behind that. There's, there's buildings that we, we heat up and um, musical instruments and great sound. And then people, of course, who help uh, officiate and lead things. Uh, and then for me, thank you, you take care of me. That's part of your giving as you provide for my family. You also invest in student ministry. You invest in other community outreach aspects. You invest in global missions. That's my heart and passion, where you're investing in Bible translation and radio ministries, bringing the gospel to those who've never heard it. Those are just some of the many places that giving through specifically family church is spread out. And the last one is that they just have too much debt. And I think that this is a a challenging place to be if you found yourself where debt has overrun you, that you basically have become a slave more or less to the amount of debt that you have. That is a challenge. And I know that some people would, would say, until I clear my debt, I can't possibly give any. And there are some that are saying it's irresponsible to give to God if you haven't erased your debt. And I want to challenge that a little bit to say perhaps a different view. What if you asked God to join you in the reduction of your debt? And in that process, you said, I can't give much yet, Father, but I desire to give. And maybe you start small and you begin to work your way to a generous lifestyle of giving. But ultimately in that process that you ask God to join you in the removal of debt for the purpose of being generous. Because I think the honest truth is we, we often come to God, and, and I've heard this before, where people say, I'll come to God, or I'll come to church, or I'll, I'll surrender once I get my life in, pl- in order or in set up in place where God would be pleased with me. And sometimes we say the same thing about money. I can give as soon as I make enough. Challenge that thinking a little bit today. So where are we going to be looking at today? I want you to open, if you would, your Bibles or your apps to 1 Timothy 6, and we're going to start there at verse 17, 1 Timothy 6. I want to come from this letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing, and he uses a strong word, and he starts like this. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You see, God is not stingy. He said he graciously, he richly provides us with things for our enjoyment. He's not opposed to you enjoying the things with that you can do with finances. But here's the the command is, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. And ultimately, here's why because we end up putting our hope in wealth. We end up looking for safety in wealth. We end up looking for rescue in wealth rather than putting our hope in God. And as it says, it's uncertain. Wealth is uncertain. If you've ever lost a substantial amount of money in a drop of a hat, in the twinkling of an eye, in the dropping of a stock market, you know what it's like, that wealth disappears quickly but God is richly here for us. And then he says this, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life 
that is truly life. What I believe God is getting at is he says, if you want to really encompass the follower of Christ life, When you begin to live a life of generosity, you will find that you are free, that there's a life that's truly life, and it's enjoyable, and it's good, and it feels right, and it feels good to give. And I want to tell you before I go into the next piece, you know, honestly, it would be be wrong of me as a pastor to not talk about money. It'd be irresponsible. And so I hope that as you're listening, you're, you're opening your ears to hear, what, what is it that God is going to challenge me at today? What is it that you're, you're desiring to hear today? And so here's how I've broken this message apart. If you look at your notes, you're going to be jumping back and forth a little bit. But, but here's the, the premise. The first thing is what grace giving is not. So first of all, grace giving is not random and irresponsible. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, there's this concept of hit or miss. I give here and then I don't give there. Or I give sometimes, but uh, when it's inconvenient, I don't. And there's this idea of just randomness. Um, Every now and then, or yeah, when it's a special event or a holiday, then I might give a little bit. This is, that is not what grace giving is based on. The other thing it's not is irresponsible. And what I mean by that is there are ministries around the world you can invest in. There are also good causes But some of those good causes are not advancing the kingdom of God. And so you have to wrestle with that and say, is this really the best place to invest my finances? Some may very well be and others may not. But also irresponsible, this is one of the ones that I always struggle to hear is people that perhaps, and maybe this is you and it's not to make you feel bad, but they maybe charge their giving on a credit card that's already something they can't afford. I don't think that's responsible giving. I think we need to be careful that we're not trying to, to give in a way that puts us further into debt. I don't think that's God's heart. So what is grace giving then? Well, the first one I would say that grace giving is based on is intentional stewardship. Intentional stewardship. Not only a stewardship of my life, but my finances. And so uh, in 2 Corinthians 9, it says it this way, each one of you should give what you've decided to give in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, there's joy in giving when it's done with the right motivation and the right heart. It's intentional. It says, I look at what God has graciously given me, and I invest in him back in his kingdom out of the same generous nature. God loves us so much. He's so generous for us. Wouldn't it be a natural thing to find joy in giving? I mean, it even says that Jesus, as he was going to the cross, that it was for the joy before him, he endured it. There was joy. He was intentional in his giving of himself. We need to be intentional in ours as well. The second one I will press into is that grace giving is not based on feeling. So many times I hear comments like, I just don't feel close to God, or I don't feel like he's active in my life, or there's a, you've got some I'm sure you've heard or maybe even uttered yourself. But here's the deal. Based on feelings does not go like this. I think I'll give to, get to God today because I feel like very blessed. And I want to give today because I feel that way. But then next week, it's like, I'm just not really into giving right now. I just don't feel so good. It's not based on feelings. It's not a, I'll give when I feel like it. It's, a, it's, it's not based on, uh, if, if I feel like what's going to happen with it is productive. These are all based on the emotion of feeling. And that is not what grace giving is found in. In fact, it says this, that ba- grace giving is based on a response to God's example in Christ. It's an outpouring of the greatest example of outpouring of everything for us. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus, the the eternal God of the universe, empties himself to be nothing. We just celebrated Christmas to come, Emmanuel, God with us born as a human baby, poured everything out for us. 
ultimately to live this perfect life and to die on a cross and then rise again, proving he is God, defeating death. See, grace giving is a response to that. Because Christ was the example of what it looks like to give all, I mean everything. He didn't withhold anything for, from us for us. He desires to be with us. You see, I don't know if you realize how rich you are. You see, because of what Christ has done and offers up to you freely, a gift of salvation, when you receive that by surrendering your life, believing in him, trusting in him, you inherit not only a family to be in the kingdom of God, but all that goes with that inheritance and a secure eternity with him. You'll never have to be in the presence of sin ever again and the power over you. Oh, praise God for that. You get to live with Jesus in eternity. And even though the real struggles of this world, they are here, they hurt, bills really do come, I get it. But when I have a perspective that beyond those bills and beyond that pain, I am richly blessed because of that example of Christ, what he did for me. Shouldn't I live that way as well? The third one that grace giving is not, is not to improve God's opinion of me. You see, that's manipulative giving. You see, God, I'm going to give uh, hundreds of dollars with the hopes that you will find favor in me. Or perhaps you try to earn salvation into heaven by being generous. You see, that's manipulative. And that is not what God's heart is. He says, no, no, I want it to be generous and outpouring as a response. Or maybe you say, God will love me more if I give. Or worse yet, God doesn't love me very much because I don't give. See, those are deceptive lies that, that keep you from the heart of generosity that God so desperately wants you to have. Not to be manipulative. So what is grace giving? Grace giving is based on trust and inner motivation. A trust in God that is an outpouring of an inner motivation. I want to read to you 2 Corinthians 8. So if you can quickly go there, go for it. Otherwise, I'm just going to read. You can just listen. I want you to hear about the outpouring of the Spirit of God in these believers. In the Macedonian church, I want you to listen to this. It says this, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their outflowing joy, excuse me, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Did you catch what happened there? It says, at this region, the Macedonian churches, in the midst of severe trial and extreme poverty, there was an upwelling of rich generosity. For I testify they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. In this important piece, they gave of themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. You see, as they surrendered themselves fully to Christ, the Holy Spirit became a part of them, and the natural outpouring was generosity. The Spirit was at work. And man, I just, I can't get over this statement that it says that they basically went in and they urgently pleaded to be a part of generosity toward God's people. That's the heart I want to have. I want you to have. I hate the fact that it's so easy for me to look at, I love fishing, so to look at a fishing pole and go, oh, 200 bucks, no problem. And then to have a moment where, hey, there's a need. And I'm like, oh man, 200 bucks. Why do I do that? Why? Why haven't I come out of that shell of my stupid flesh? It drives me crazy. But I wrestle with this. It's a, it's a reality. I just, I wrestle. Why don't I just go, yes, 200 bucks there. No way I'm not going to get that. Or, wow, that fishing pole is really expensive, but that 200 bucks, that's easy. Why can't I flip the script in my head? I struggle with these things. My, my guess is you struggle too. But see, here's the deal. I don't know if you heard that last other statement. It says, 
in the midst of severe trial, they're overflowing joy. You see, God desires a generous heart that is giving, that is joyous. In fact, so in my, uh, in my giving, I can remember transitioning from teaching in the public school to being in full-time ministry. And there was this weird moment when I got my first check that was your giving presented to me to feed my family and pay my bills. And I'm like, do I, do I give this to the church? How does that work? Like, I received it from the church. Do I give it to the church? And then it was pretty clear God was like, uh, yeah, you do. Like, it's not where it came from. It's how will you use it? Because no matter what, it's all his. Whether you got it from an educational board or from a, a body of believers, it's his. And so I wrestled with that. And But one of my practices, and this isn't to at all downplay how you give, but, but I'm still a little bit, I guess it's old-fashioned or maybe just stubborn, but I like writing the check out. I write a check each month as my first giving that I say, thank you, God. This is my first. And, and the, the practice for me personally of writing that is every month there's a temptation. You know what I could do with this? You know what I could maybe improve or buy or I could go somewhere and I go, oh, no, no, no. You're right. Thank you, God. And that's an act of worship. It's an outpouring of generosity that, that each month I say, thank you first. And I try to make that the first gift the first check each month. And so I challenge you, if yours is an automatic giving online, that's fine. I just challenge you to really evaluate, why are you doing it? Is it an act of worship? Are you finding joy in your generosity toward our great saving God? That's the heart behind it. The last one I will finish up here is this idea. Grace giving is not bound by the law. Now, there are historical references of the Jewish people as God was implementing strategies to help him lead these people. And he said, give 10%. This was a big deal. But here's the reality. If you do your research, you'll find there was other offerings. So it was more like 20%. But see, the limitations of this are, it was good at the time, but see, we're free from that. It's no longer a law imposed on us or a religious restriction. In fact, I think it's actually limiting because that word tithe is basically 10%. And so I think it's a good marker for us to say that's a good place to, to at least get to that amount. I think that's good. But I think one of the, the things that we find happening is there are some that can't reach 10% yet and they live in guilt. And so no matter how much they give, it's never 10% and they find themselves guilty, feeling guilty, condemning themselves, assuming that God is disappointed. And then there are those who could give far more than 10%, but they go, ah, 10%, I gave the 10. And so rather than living generously where God is calling them to, they're bound and restricted by 10%. So here's what I want to really focus on today. What grace giving is based on the Holy Spirit's leading. And, and as if I first read this passage, it's, it's an interesting part in Matthew. And Jesus is talking about laying up treasures in heaven this investing in the kingdom of God. But then he gets to this key statement in, uh, I'm in chapter 6, verse 24. He says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I've read that a lot of times, and as I prepared for this message, I realized something that was really clear to me. You see, prior to, to inviting God to dwell within me, and accepting forgiveness and salvation. You see, money was my God. And then when the Holy Spirit dwelled in me, all of a sudden there was immediately a conflict. You see, God desired me to worship him, not money. Man, my flesh is, I'm just like struggle with this. I just, I want, I want, I need, I think. And God says, so would you want me or that? And so this idea of the Holy Spirit leading, I think what Jesus is speaking into is saying, now that the Holy Spirit is in you, you're going to be in conflict because the Spirit of God desires worship of God from you. And you will be challenged now if you won't surrender to God, that now you will be in conflict because money will have a huge uh, position perhaps on the throne. And we're called by the Spirit's leading to begin to knock that idol down and to live out of generosity. And so I was thinking about it this way. Um, 
when I live in a an idea of grace giving, not a law biting one that it says I can give what God has put on my heart, as we read earlier, so that I can give with glorious joy. And for some of you, man, the idea of 10% would be, oh my goodness, that is so much. And I think it's a good marker to begin to strive for if you're not there yet. And for some of you, I think you've probably been a 10% giver for a long time, and maybe God is saying, there's more I'd love to do with you. There's more I'd love to grow with you. Because So if you have this view, if you see God is pointing at you saying, you don't give enough, then I think you've lost the picture of our loving Father. I think our loving, gracious Father says, look what I've done for you. Would you partner with me? I want you to experience me. And your love of money that can get in the way of that hinders what I want to do in and with you. So I encourage you to think about your generous heart. And so here's where I'm at in this final thought. Two ways we can live. Statement one, how much do I have to give? Ah, God, how much do I have to give today? How much? How much is enough, right? Or how much can I give back? See, I'm not going to talk about a prosperity gospel. I'm not going to talk about how if you give, God's just going to abundantly bless you. That may be true. You may say, guess what? We're in a season now, and I'm going to do some work. But I'm going to tell you that God wants you to have, a, I believe, a mind that says, how much can I give back? Challenge you to that thinking. How much can you give back? This is my last statement for this message that I hope well, you'll hear clearly. You see, the greatest recipient of your generosity is you. The greatest recipient of your generosity is you. You see, the process of being generous with finances is how God allows us and teaches us to trust him. If I can trust you with money, I can't fake it. (laughs) I can't fake read that I gave money away. I can't fake pretend and write my own. That's called counterfeit. It's literally an action that it is not fakeable. Do I trust you, God? Do I trust you enough to say, man, I could do a lot with this, but you can do so much more. The greatest recipient of your generosity is you. You are able to invest in kingdom living, in kingdom expansion, you are, able to inv- you are able to invest in what God wants to do through you and to expand his kingdom, laying up treasures for yourself. And finally, that you are rich because he became poor. If you begin to view yourself rich, I think you will find it's much easier to be generous when you have a bigger picture of just how rich you are and how much the Father has poured over you. I think the response would be, I can't wait to give more back. I'm going to release our campuses and let each pastor there kind of walk you through that next challenge. Thanks for joining me today. I love you guys.